Good morning, everyone. I give you a very warm, and I literally mean that, a very warm welcome uh, to church this morning. Um, I'll maybe, I was going to say, for the building fund, off you uh, some of my sermon notes that you can spend the rest of the service fanning yourself, uh, just to cool uh, yourself. To close the side door here, unfortunately, which is because there was a nice breeze coming my direction, but I was getting it, not you. Um, I didn't want you feeling a bit uh, overwarm. Um, so we'll just try and uh, watch that during the service. We'll maybe keep the, the outside doors open this morning, uh, which will maybe allow a wee bit of breath coming through uh, the, the back. I hope that's not going to be too cold on those sitting at the back of the congregation. Give you a very warm welcome, as I said, and especially the visitors uh, with us. Uh, although, as I said to the, one of the individuals, it's not so much they're visiting, but they're coming back home. And so uh, to Betsy Mann and family and to friends, uh, we give you a warm welcome too. To Naomi, um, I'm scanning around, there you go. Naomi, how are you? It's lovely to have you back with us this morning too. Uh, pray that God will bless. And to others that are visiting with us this morning, we give you a very warm welcome. We hope you feel at home here amongst us in the family of God. Just uh, one announcement I want to draw to your attention this morning, the uh, Congregational Committee election. Uh, the voters list is still out there in the best of it this week. Uh, you can just double check that, but hopefully next week we will have voting papers uh, available to you. We're seeking 15 uh, committee members uh, for you to vote. When you get the voting papers, there'll be little, uh, some names will have a black uh, box marked out sort of thing there, already existing elders just so that you don't end up voting uh, for folk who are already there on the committee and that will be a vote uh, cast and an error will not have any big impact but uh, we'll chat to you more about that next Sunday and in the weeks uh, to come. We come uh, to worship and to the Lord's table this morning and so we pray uh, that you will feel relaxed and at home as we share in this wonderful time of worship. The psalmist reminds us, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Saviour, and my hope is in you all the day long. And so we give thanks because we are here for what God has already done for us in Christ. And so we worship him today as we stand together, if you can, to sing King of Kings to Majesty. <laughs> Amen. 
Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray together. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we come and bow before you, your majesty, this morning. We greet you as the sovereign Lord, creator of the universe, and in Christ our Redeemer and Lord. As we have just sung of the greatness and the reality of our adoption to be children of God, we realise how unworthy we are. Yet we praise you that we can come to pray through the grace and forgiveness we have received at the cross. May indeed we live to serve you in all that we do day by day. For our desire is to walk where you would lead and travel this road of discipleship. To be faithful even when the way is hard, when the path is uncertain. Grant us patience to keep going following the upward call of God in Christ. Forgive us when our commitment is poor, our faith is weak. When fears drive us into hiding, when conflict and sacrifice push us backward, grant us courage to step up, knowing that you are always with us. At times we have doubts, crises of faith even, as we see the suffering and trials and pain around us. Grant us obedience to follow your example, to live by faith and not by sight. Encourage us once more of the confidence we have in your eternal kingdom. Where one day there will be no more pain or sorrow, darkness or death. Help us to remember that Jesus endured the cross with all its rejection and pain and trusted himself to your perfect plan. May his life inspire us to lay everything aside to run the race as you transform us daily by the power of the Holy Spirit to be more and more like you. Hear our prayers, for we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Boys and girls, I want to talk to you just for a moment. You can keep uh, your seats. Caroline, can you throw this over to me? Thank you. Who likes to be the odd one out? Who likes to be different? Do you? Does it feel good? Brilliant. That's super. Not everybody likes that. Everybody prefers to blend in. One time at school, our rugby team won the school's cup again. I want to emphasize that. Won it again. Uh, because they seem to win it every year. Sometimes we just let others have a go at it. That other school in Belfast down by the City Hall, just not so good as the one I went to further up in Malone Road. But, huge, huge shade. And the headmaster there, and the whole school was out, and the headmaster said, here we go, and the shield is now going to be presented to the school by Mark Russell. I didn't play well. I didn't even know that the headmaster knew my name. I had hoped that he didn't. And then I started to panic. Why does he know my name? Why is my name on his lips? What other stuff is sitting on his desk? And I sort of thought, that's not good. It was David Russell who was the captain of the first 15. We don't always like to be the odd one out. I wonder whether or not we can spot the odd one out in this. What's the odd one out? What do you reckon? Red apple, absolutely. That makes abundantly clear, isn't it? The red apple is the wrong one. It sits a wee bit differently. Who prefers red apples? Who prefers green apples? Who would ever, rather have a nice nectarine? <laughs> Who would rather have a bar of chocolate? <laughs> there we go. Where's the odd one out here? What do you reckon? Who's going to tell me which breed of sheep these are? <laughs> Isabella, what do you reckon? It's a... The dog! Can you see the dog? Right in the very middle, in the front row, just behind that, there's a little sort of sheepdog type thing in the middle. Did you see it? Or are you looking at the black-faced one over on the far side? 
You see, sometimes we maybe blend in and it's a bit harder to see whether or not we're the odd one out. What about this one? What do you think? Now, I'm going to tell you, I think this is a trick one. Okay? What do you think? Green one? Green one? Could be. I like that. Anybody else have an alternative? Yes, sir. The straight one, well done. One without the curve, do you see that? Anything else? Well, you see, I, I looked at that. One has no curve, so it's slightly different. Two curved to the right, you see that? So the red one on the left hand side and the green one on the far right, they both curve the same way. One's green, three are red. But what about the stalks? Look at the stalks. Two curve more to the left, two curve more to the right. Sometimes there's that more of a blend. Sometimes it's much harder to see the odd one out. Sometimes we get a little confused. I'm going to be chatting to the grown-ups uh, a little later on a story in the Bible. The story is about Peter and John going up to the temple and as they're there, they meet a man outside the temple and he asks for money. He was begging because he hadn't been able to walk since he was born. He was lame. And he asked for money and Peter and John said, look, I don't have any money, but what I have will give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And for some of you, you know, and he went walking and leaping and praising God. And what happened then was Peter and John got into trouble. They got into trouble for healing them. They got into trouble because actually they were talking about Jesus. They were the odd ones out. They were starting to talk about how Jesus was the way of salvation. And what they say ultimately when they appear before all the leaders, they say this. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were prepared to be the odd ones out. They were prepared to be the ones who would talk about Jesus. The one who would share their faith and say what Jesus can do in our life. To be willing. To be different. To be willing to stand out. Now they look like any other normal person going up to the temple that day. But their hearts have been changed by being with Jesus. And what Jesus had done. As he had saved them and brought them to be his disciples. You see. Sometimes we don't want to be the odd one out. Sometimes perhaps we try and blend in a bit like the dog in the middle of the sheep. And yet we're encouraged to be different. That our lives would tell about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And to share in that. And that's scary. That's difficult. But it was difficult for Peter and John too. The place would have been packed. Maybe they thought when they prayed over him, the man was healed and he, he jumped up. Maybe they were said, shh, say, say nothing, sit down. Wait until we get out of the room. And yet it was with the power of God that they began to speak and to share and to give that example. That same power is available to us today. That same strength is ours as we trust God to help us to stand out for Him. And so we're going to sing that song this morning Be bold. Be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. We'll stand and sing. And then after this, you're out to uh, Bible Discovery Club and, and Connect One, and that uh, goes from sort of primary school all the way up into secondary school uh, and be heading out across to the halls across the way. <laughs>
So we turn to God's Word into the book of Acts, uh, following on from that story of Peter and John healing uh, the beggar. And the conversation, I suppose interrogation they had from the Sanhedrin. And so they're eventually told to go and say nothing more about Jesus. And here's what happens after that. This is God's word. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to him. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. And may God add a blessing to this, his holy word. As I said, for many of us, we don't really like being that odd one out. If you're going to a party, if you're being invited, you'll maybe have a conversation with others. Are you going to bring something? Or maybe you ask the question, what do you want to wear to this event? I remember in college, every year uh, towards the end of the second term, there would be a photograph of all the ministry students. Um, we would sit on the steps of Union and they'll take a photograph, faculty, everybody there, um, all sorts of various students. Now, one of my colleagues obviously missed the memo, which said that it was to be formal dress. Now, that meant suits, shirt and tie. He turned up this day in jeans and a t-shirt. So you can imagine how he felt. Thankfully, uh, there were some of the other uh, fellows who were living in the college at the time and so they ran up the stairs, got him a spare shirt and tie. So at least from the top half he looked presentable and they stuck him somewhere at the back um, and, and so it was there. But being that odd one out. But what we see here as we read of the story of Peter and John, they were happy to be the odd ones out. Not to fit in, not to tow the line, but to stand out for the sake of Jesus. You see, that call to discipleship, to be different, to build our foundations on the promises of Christ, to become more christ -like. And that might appear more challenging today than ever before. But actually, Jesus warned his disciples. It's as real for us today that the way of the cross would lead to hardship and rejection. He tells us that we are to be in the world and influence, but not of the world. We are to be distinctive, living differently. You see, sometimes I think what we have done is we've tried to escape the world. We've built our walls, we've closed our doors. We're called not to conform to its patterns, and yet we've maybe embraced things that we shouldn't have. But we are to be his people. From the Old Testament days, God chose Israel to be his special people. There back in Leviticus we can read, So do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live, 
or like the people of Canaan where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. Rather, you must obey all my regulations to be careful to obey my decrees, for I am the Lord your God. Throughout that early Old Testament, we read that God said, I will be your God and you will be my people if you follow my ways, that you live distinctively in the land around you, so that people might see. And through their life and witness, others would come to the knowledge of the sovereign God. In the New Testament, then, we see that Jesus' death and resurrection, the doors were swung open and God's salvation was to spread to all. Peter says that in his first letter to the church. To those scattered by migration and perhaps even persecution. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Others might say we are God's peculiar possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. To be different, to, to be unique. And that was so that others might see our differences. That our lives would always point to Jesus. Now that might be easy when we're sitting together here in the church. We can all look and act like good Christians. But if you're the only Christian in your office, if you're the only Christian in your classroom, if you're the only Christian in the workhouse, that becomes much harder, more difficult. And yet that was exactly the challenge Peter and John were facing here in Jerusalem. Are we willing to be different? You see, we're no different to Peter and John. It's not that they all of a sudden had this wonderful theological training. That they had so much extra stuff going on in their lives. Because what they, we read in, in Acts is that they were deemed to be unschooled, uneducated, ordinary men and like us. But it was a part of the Holy Spirit. In response to their obedience, which made a difference, which gave them a night in jail. And then to that hastily convened trial on the next day. They were different. But they were also determined. You see, you can have it your own way. I don't know what your choice here. Um, whether Burger King, McDonald's, Kentucky. Or maybe it's something else. How many of you remember Nibblers? What was the one at the top of? Um, gone, but it, it's completely gone. It was a sort of a franchise, a, a hamburger place. It was one of the first ones up from the city hall. I'll remember it when I'm sitting and having my dinner later on. Lord no, it wasn't. Lord, Lord Hamels, thank you. Our, our minds are always a tune. Peculiar, but they are. But did you know, allegedly, Subway has 37 million variations of having their sandwiches. That's the mathematician. And you go home and count the number of different breads you have on the spoons. It's not only the fact that there's six, eight, there's a different types of bread, but then you can either have a six inch or a foot long, and then you get into the stuff and all the various bits, and every time you change it, all of a sudden, this is where this dynamic comes from. You have it your own way. And sometimes, do we at times pick and choose what we want to believe? Our faith in Jesus Christ, we want to have it our own way. We like this today. This will fit okay into this circumstance. But actually, when we're getting challenged, we'll let that drop. We'll not uh, run with that. Now, there's people, there are places. Today we're encouraged to accept a pluralism, that all beliefs are equal. We're called to accept an ethical relativism, that there's no absolutes, that morals are subjective, it's all down to the individual. Rather than loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, of loving our neighbour as ourselves, we are told that we are just to love ourselves. We are in the centre of it all. The self-actualization or solutions come from within really 
what it's saying is the world revolves around me. My rights, my opinions are paramount. And so the difficulty is when we begin to believe that, that my rights, my opinions are paramount, then there's no open dialogue, there's no chance to contribute. All I see is attack. Maybe we're a bit like that at times. But Peter and John went to the temple that day. They met the man Liam from birth. Every day he went to the same spot. But every day he was outside the temple. He couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. He couldn't receive the blessings of God because of his illness. When Peter and John come that day, he is healed in the name of Jesus. And it causes a massive stir. People are running and shouting. They, they have seen this. There's no doubt about it. This is a man who has sat there for 40 years. And now he's up and jumping and shouting and praising God. And Peter and John begin to preach. And another 2,000 we hear come to faith. And because of that, they get locked up. The next day, the Sanhedrin, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law, convene to to work out what they're going to do. Luke recalls in his gospel that it was the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law who sat in, in judgment over Jesus. And they asked them, by what power or in whose name do you do this? These are the religious leaders of Israel and they have no comprehension of what God is doing at that time. To hear it is Jesus the crucified one. They're filled with fear and dread because they thought they had dealt with him. They thought that they had finished him. And so they asked themselves the question, what are we going to do about it? They too are amazed. Amazed at how these men have spoken. And that was a reaction to Jesus teaching time and time again. And so we see the, the, the real sense of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in them. They chat about it privately. They can't even speak his name. Once again, here is something that God has done. God has blessed this man, restored him into the community of faith that he has been kept out of for so long. And even greater that than that, God has revealed himself to him. And their answer to it is, don't do it again. The Sanhedrin were thinking, we can have it our own way. We can't have it your way, Peter and John. Because for us, to obey God was really to obey them. Yet Peter and John must be faithful to Jesus. You see, that is our challenge today. Will we follow the culture of the day or will we follow Christ? Will we be as determined not to let anything hamper us? But as we share our faith, as we speak to others in response to questions, in response to criticisms, that we are able to, to talk about Jesus and tell them about their love and grace. And so we come into that story then in our reading. They're sent home with a warning. And I like this, they went back to their own people. And I sort of thought, surely the Israelites, surely those in the synagogue were their own people. And yet we're beginning to see this separation. We see fellowship and we see prayer. They go back to the room, but this is not a bolt the doors type upper room after the crucifixion. They come, they join together in prayer. That's critical for us in the church today, to join together in prayer, to share and support one another. The Bible tells us they raised their voices. And I wondered about that word, and how do we raise our voices? Why do we lift them? Is it anger? Is it frustration? The question is, who do we lift them up to? Are we angry that we're being persecuted and the government isn't doing enough to help us? 
Or do we lift our voices in praise and prayer to God? That he might incline his ear and lift us. So as they begin to pray, they remind themselves he is the sovereign author of all things. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. They turn to scripture, into that strong foundation. But do we know where to turn to? I know at school I got one of those little Gideon New Testaments. And in that there was little hints of when you're in trouble, when this is happening, when all these other things are going on, this is where you turn to. But do we know where to turn to? Do we know where to find our sustenance? But then here's another thing. How long do you spend each day looking at social media feeds? How long do you spend each day reading papers and magazines? How long do you spend reading the Bible? Studying it, memorizing it, finding places that would give you that foundation and strength. To remind yourselves at times when things go wrong, God works it for good. Remember in the story of Joseph back in Genesis? Here he is, thrown into the pit, sold into slavery, and yet there he was in the position that God needed him to be, to work through the famine. And to bring blessing not only to the Egyptians but to the surrounding world. He tells his brothers what you meant for evil God planned for good. Even at the beginning of Acts 2. Peter speaks about the fact that God handed Jesus over. He used the selfish ambitions of others for his good plan. In Acts 4, we read that it was Herod and Pontius Pilate. We read that Sanhedrin, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the the political elite, the religious leaders, all of these ones together, who would normally not be in cahoots. God brought them together so that Christ would die. And in dying, bring us life and hope and peace. Help us to speak your word, they ask. They don't ask for protection. They don't ask for for God to strike out his, his hand and smite those who are against them. They say, help us to speak your word. John's prologue, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. They ask that they could do it with great boldness, with confidence, with certainty. In Romans 10, Paul writes, But how can can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? A call to preach. To speak the word of Christ boldly. We read that their prayer was answered. And power and ability falls upon them. Not just with Peter and John. But all in the room. Salvation is free but discipleship costs everything we have. So the quote from Billy Graham. And I thought about that, those choices that we have, how we order our food. What about the choices we have of what we watch and how we watch it on TV now? It can all come uh, streamed through our phones and our tablet. It's no longer four channels on a TV where if you want to change the channel, you have to get up and walk across the floor and push a button. We can watch it in our bedrooms, our bathrooms, wherever it is we want. In our desire to blend in, do we only turn to Jesus then when we are in trouble? We only pick him, choose him. At those times, and at other times we pick an alternative, we leave him on the shelf, not needed this week. By the way, you do that if you're ordering your groceries online. You order your favourites. And then you get prompted, oh, you didn't order this this week. These are things you normally order. But 
That's called the discipleship. It's a call to offer our time. Our time in making sure we set time aside for worship. A time set aside to read God's word. A time set that we would sit in his presence in prayer. It's a call to offer our talents, our gifts, whatever we are good at. And whether that be uh, in a secular side, in a football pitch, or in a building. Can we use those gifts for the glory of God? To offer our treasures, our resources, our money. That we serve him because he has given us all for us. You see, it may cost us now. But what about the joy set before us? What about the reality of what stands in heaven? And we too perhaps need to pray that. Consider their threats, Lord. But we know at times we are put up to the cost. We are given it tough. But there we bring our situations to God and we expect him to act. Maybe not as quickly he did in Acts 4, but we expect him to move. And as he prayed, the power of the Spirit fell. Somebody wrote that the room was shaken. So that they would become unshakable. God's power is still there for us today. That we might feel his presence. The power of the Holy Spirit that we will indeed speak with boldness. You see when we come to this table this morning. We come reminded that God has done it all for us. But we come to this table committing ourselves that we might share in his suffering, share in his life, share in the reality of what he had set out to do to make disciples of all nations. As we partake of the bread and wine, we admit that we wish to do the same. Are we willing to be an odd one out for Jesus? To be part of his peculiar possession? That we might live for him? And speak boldly in his name? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. But more than that, we thank you for your power. The power that equips us. The power that enables us to remind us of all things. That Lord, that we, in times of trial, will be willing to, to answer with, with grace and love and mercy. As we reach out to those who, who, who do not know you. Perhaps are even hostile to you. But rather, Lord, we will be seen that others might know that there's something different about us because we love Jesus and Jesus loves us. Help us, Lord, in those times of trouble. Help us, Lord, as we sit and spend time in your presence that you might fill us day by day. Help us, Lord. To live for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> and so as we come to the Lord's table, we sing together. We'll maybe keep our seats as we sing, Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away. Slain for us, and we remember.
so the people at home don't miss my lovely face. This is the table of Christ. The bread, the wine, the invitation to eat and drink are all his. He is our host. We are his guests. And so all you who confess him as Lord, from whatever branch of the church you come, you're welcome in this house and at this table. Hear the gracious words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus tells us I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We're going to stand in a little moment. I'm just preparing your minds for this as we say together the words of the Apostle Creed. But I know that you have been sitting for a while and it's warm. So please take your time as you stand. Just in case it takes a wee bit of time for the blood to move uh, through your body. So let us stand together, if we can, that we may declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us hear how St. Paul reports the instructions the Lord Jesus gave us about this meal as they are set down as we find them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Lord Jesus took bread and wine and gave thanks. So we take these elements of bread and wine for his use and ours in this sacrament. And so we give thanks for him. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the table spread before us. The uniqueness of this meal and all it represents. For you have not just given us daily bread, but you give to us the bread of life, inner nourishment for our souls, food which means our spiritual hunger is quenched. At times our bodies may be empty, but we thank you that in Christ we can be content in all circumstances, for we live and breathe and act through the one who strengthens us. So we come to give you our praise and our thanks. For when we remember all that Jesus has done and making us right before you, through the Holy Spirit that continues at work in us day and daily, as we are called to participate in your call to make disciples, to those who obediently follow after Christ, 
and who will transform families, communities and countries. May we remember that this meal is but a foretaste of what lies ahead for those who love you and serve you, and that one day there will be an inheritance of nations from every tribe and tongue. In the simplicity of what we do now, may we experience the depth of your love, your mercy and forgiveness, as we offer ourselves afresh to you this day. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in the heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In a little while, when we serve, um, the elders will come and distribute amongst you firstly the bread and then uh, the wine um, hold it if you can uh, and then we will eat and drink together and we'll give you instructions as we go through that so draw near with faith receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which was given for you this blood which was shed for you and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. On the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. After pause, the minister says, In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me.
take, eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood. Drink from it, all of you.
Let us hear God's word. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. To live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. To redeem us from all wickedness to purify for himself the people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have put gladness in our hearts and you have satisfied our hunger with good things. In giving us your all, your very self, you have not withheld anything from us. So how can we withhold anything from you, our Lord and our God? Renew us, refresh us by your Holy Spirit, so that we may walk right with you in service and in joy. Because we lift up and reveal the name of Jesus in everything we do and in everything we say, for his glory alone. Amen. We stand together to sing our closing hymn. Take up your cross, the Saviour said. Let us worship. Amen. Amen.